Well, of course, it is a joy always to be with you, but it's certainly a joy on this morning as we celebrate our risen Lord. And so I invite you to continue with me in worship as we go to God's Word. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24, looking at a familiar story for some of us. It's the story about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're going to be in Luke 24, 13 through 35. As you're turning there, I ran across this a few days ago, and I thought this would be a, an interesting way to start our sermon today. Uh, there were a couple of psychologists that were really trying to measure whether people can kind of miss opportunities or miss that which is obvious when it's right in front of them. So they got a group of people, and they had an experiment, and uh, they were instructed to watch two teens playing basketball And they had to watch intently, and they had to focus and count how many times each team passed the ball. So, of course, you know, just typical basketball game, dribble, 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 pass, pass, pass. And so they're marking their tallies and counting and counting. And, uh, you know, sometime in the middle of that video, there was a man in a gorilla suit that literally ran across right in front of the camera, beat his chest really loudly, and ran off camera. And the reason is the psychologist would go back and they would ask okay, how many passes did you count? And they would say, I counted this many passes. And what do you think about the man in the gorilla suit? And the majority of the people watching this actually said, what gorilla? (laughs) I mean, believe it or not, what gorilla? They didn't see it. And I say that because oftentimes we miss that which is significant when it's right in front of us. The story of Easter, the story of the resurrection of Jesus for pretty much all of the disciples, all of the people that were encountering Jesus on this day, seemed to miss that which was obvious right in front of them. Mary thinks that the body of Jesus had been stolen. You know, Peter sees the linen wrappings. He he can't work out what that's all about. The disciples are slow, slow to understand, so slow to understand. They don't understand the Scriptures You know, the angels question Mary. She still doesn't know what's going on. She mistakes the gardener or or mistakes Jesus to be the gardener in John's account. And then she clings to him and Jesus says that she shouldn't. Uh, You hardly get more misunderstandings into a couple of paragraphs if you tried. Uh, The the gospels are remarkable on this single fact and single uh, statement that the disciples missed that which was clear right in front of them. One author says it this way, the point is, of course, that Easter has burst into our world. The world of space, time, and matter, real history, and real people, and real life. But our minds and imaginations are too small to contain it. So we do our best to put the sea into a bottle, I love that, and fit the explosive fact of the resurrection into the possibilities we already know about. Uh, The title of my message today is very simple, it's very succinct, it's Seeing Jesus. And and if I could say that that would be our goal, however you join us today, whether you join us here in person, you're joining us online, you're joining us in the fellowship hall, uh, however it is that you might join us, my prayer and the prayer of this church is that you would see Jesus. That you would take nothing else away from this message today, you take nothing else away from this service As great as the music is, as great as the fellowship is, as great as the snacks in the gym were before, we want you to see Jesus. We want you to see that which ultimately will change your life. I'm focusing on the story of the two disciples that says that they are on the road here to Emmaus. And Luke tells us about this story. It's a profound account. There's so much literary art that goes into this that we'll try to draw out and, and the, the point being is that these disciples, they were visiting with Jesus, and they were seeing Jesus right in front of them, but they had no idea that it was actually Jesus, the resurrected Lord. Uh, they had no idea. They're probably returning home to a village called Emmaus after Passover. They had been there for some time uh, during the week, and they had participated in all the different Passover festival rituals. Uh, And everything that happened with Jesus, it was like headline news in the Jerusalem Herald, right? And they didn't quite understand and grasp the meaning of it all. Even still, in Jesus' ministry, time and time again, he predicted his death, burial, and resurrection. And, And the disciples continually were dull of heart and dull of thought and mind and didn't quite understand what exactly it was that Jesus was talking about 
And so Luke gives us this story, I think, for two different reasons. First of all, Luke is a historian. And much of what Luke has to say in his gospel is very historical in nature. It feels like a history lesson. In fact, he says at the very beginning of his gospel account that he researched and he compiled information and interviews to bring an account of Jesus' life and ministry. So it is a historical account, but Luke's goals and our goal this morning transcends that of just history. We are to look at this through the eyes of a theologian to ask the question, what does this mean? And ultimately, who is Jesus and what is it that he accomplished? Do we see Jesus in accordance to how God the Father wants us to see Jesus? Do we see Jesus in accordance to how he's portrayed in the Old Testament? And so pick up with me here in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to read verses 13 to 14, and you're going to read about, and we're going to read about these two disciples and the sadness on their journey regarding Jesus. In verse 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Uh, I love the way Luke begins this account. He, he uses the word in Greek for behold. He, he does this oftentimes in the scriptures in his account. Uh, behold, this story is really important. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a way to gather our attention and to grab our attention. And we're told that they are going to a village named Emmaus. Now, historians are, are kind of in disagreement here as far as what the exact location of this village is. Uh, we don't have real clear, precise understanding of what this village is or where it is. Luke tells us that it was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. And, and that's important, again, because Luke oftentimes includes these seemingly insignificant historical details to prove the case that he is indeed a historian, that he is telling something that happened in real life. Now, there's something subtle here in the irony of the way Luke introduces this story, because up to this point, from Luke chapter 9, verse 51 onward, Jesus has his eyes set towards Jerusalem, and he knows that he is en route to Jerusalem, ultimately to be betrayed and to die and to rise again. He predicts it several times. But these disciples, and again, I think it's somewhat ironic, are leaving Jerusalem, now, they're still in the same geographic area, certainly, but they are leaving Jerusalem. They are leaving the place from where there was the climax of the story in this gospel account. And they are in discussion with one another. Luke actually uses the word homileo. It's where we get the word homily from. And it's just amazing and it's fascinating to me to think about what it was their conversation, what their conversation was like. And it was rather intense in nature. They were debating back and forth, and they didn't see things with clarity. And maybe, just maybe, they are going back to Emmaus after a week in Jerusalem for Passover, and they're thinking about, how do I begin to resume the normalcy of everyday life? But there is an encounter with Jesus. They speak with Jesus. I'm going to read here from verses 15 to 24, a longer section here. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? I love the humor. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one, literally the coming one, to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said, 
he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. I love the way, again, this is told. We are told here in verse 15, while they are talking and discussing together, again, a rather intense conversation, it's emphatic in the Greek, it's Jesus himself. It's not just Jesus, although that would have been fine to say it that way. It's Jesus himself comes and appears before them. And Luke here is is bringing us to understand that they don't recognize Jesus. Now, you're going to ask me to explain that for you, and I can't. I have no idea why they didn't recognize him. Maybe they were kind of fringe disciples. Maybe they didn't recognize him that well. Maybe they didn't spend that much time with him. Uh, But more probable is that their eyes were really closed to see the reality of who Jesus is. And in these disciples, we are to identify ourselves with these disciples. That sometimes things don't go in accordance to the way we think, and sometimes God doesn't fit into the prescribed boxes that we have for Him, and we don't recognize His doing. And so it's very likely that they were, in some sense, not allowed to see by divine intervention. Now, again, there's this conversation back and forth with Jesus, and Jesus is kind of playing along with them. Uh, somewhat kind of string them along a little bit. Uh, Maybe he takes some degree of of humor in this, I'm not sure. Uh, But there's just the humanity of this conversation that I just find to be incredibly attractive. And the only disciple that's named is a man named Cleopas. Again, this is another historical detail that Luke includes here. And if it was a fabrication, if Luke was just making up this account, he would have not named either of them, or more likely he would have named both of them. But for whatever reason, he only names Cleopas. Now, we don't know anything about these two disciples. We don't know anything about Cleopas. One tradition is that this man is actually Jesus' uncle. Don't know if that's true or not. Don't quote me on that. But it is an interesting uh, discussion. And Jesus says, well, why are you sad? What exactly happened in these last few days in Jerusalem? And they're bewildered that Jesus doesn't seem to have any inkling of understanding of what happened. Because just, again, think about it just for the duration of that week. We observed and celebrated Palm Sunday last Sunday, last week, and that's when Jesus was brought into the city, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there was all kinds of tension and a cauldron of boiling, boiling rage that began to boil over from the religious authorities for the duration of the week. This was a major, major event. What do you mean, what things? How do you not know what happened in Jerusalem? And so Jesus is kind of playing along, and they're trying to explain to Jesus who he was and what he was inevitably trying to accomplish in their minds. And interestingly, they call Jesus a prophet. Now, again, this is because this is how Luke has interwoven and told his, his, and and kind of unfolded his gospel account up to this point. And uh, we have seen that he has the theological desire to show us that Jesus is a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. He is indeed the Son of God. He is the one who is mighty indeed in word, and his miracles and his teaching demonstrates that he was a unique individual. They understood this, they recognized this, and we are to recognize it as well. And then they say that Jesus was delivered over to the hands of wicked men. Now, that word is important. If you were here with us on Good Friday, it's the same word, paradidomai. It means to be handed over. It's a callback all the way back to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, where we see a prediction 700 years prior that Jesus would be delivered over. Not only that, but they call Jesus the coming one. Now, you might just hold your finger here, and you might just turn to the beginning of the gospel of Luke for just a moment. Luke chapter 2. It's a story we usually read at Christmas, but it's in many ways a bookend here of what we see in this passage. He is the coming one. He is the one to bring redemption. 
and the desired one to bring uh, hope and reconciliation. Look at verse 25 of chapter 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation, the Redeemer of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And so these disciples with Simeon and later Anna in that same chapter, are just thinking, was he not the coming one? Was he not the one to come to redeem Israel? Now, you can imagine some of their discussion and dialogue back and forth with each other. They probably would have been trying to reconcile why was the tomb empty. It's a, it's a good opportunity for us to ask that same question. Uh, if you're thinking logically about the resurrection account, you, you have to ask yourself, on what account or on what reason do we have an empty tomb? There's only several possibilities, and only one is really realistic, and it's the most profound of all, is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. But you might say, well, maybe the religious authorities stole the body that would crumble under the weight of just thinking and asking about the motive of such a thing. The religious authorities wanted to squash a potential rebellion. The Romans and the Jews alike were jealous of him. In fact, the Jewish authorities actually posted a guard at the tomb because they said, we heard him say that he would rise from the dead, and we don't want there to be any, any potential for anyone to steal the body. What about the disciples? Maybe they stole the body. Well, the New Testament is very clear on this, and Paul tells this account in 1 Corinthians 15 that not only he and the rest of the disciples, the apostles, saw the resurrected, risen Lord, but as many as 500 witnesses at the time that he wrote that in chapter 15 had seen the Lord. And Paul says, hey, if you want to ask them what that was like, find them. They're still alive, many of them. They still live. And so the old adage is this, that someone might die for a lie. But will a significant group of people, 500 people, willingly die for what they know is a lie? Every single one of them had an encounter with the resurrected Christ that absolutely turned their lives upside down and changed their life. And many of them suffered horrific, horrific deaths on account of the resurrected Lord. We know that resurrection is outside of the scope of human experience. I came across this story about a father who was driving uh, past a cemetery with his five-year-old son, and they were kind of looking out the window, and his five-year-old saw an empty hole in the ground in the cemetery and said, look, Dad, one of them got out. <laughs> we know that that doesn't happen. We know that doesn't happen. Now, I want to get to where Jesus kind of cuts them off, and he, and he gets to what I think is the heart of the passage here in verse 25. And, and Jesus points to the entirety of the Old Testament Scriptures. Verse 25, and He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have liked to be part of that Bible study? I mean, really. <laughs> here, here they are walking, and it's not that far of a walk. And you just wonder how much ground, literally and also figuratively, Jesus is covering with them. He's going all the way back to the law to the prophets, and he is showing that it was necessary. Three little letters in the Greek, D-E-I, day. It's a very important word in the Greek. And, and Luke often uses that word, it is necessary, to argue that this was by divine necessity. It was absolutely necessary that the anointed one would come, suffer, die, 
and rise again. Now, if you lived in the first century, you had no picture of this. There is no historical suggestion that anyone, even when there was Messiah fever in the first century, that anyone thought that Messiah would die. They thought that Messiah would come as a political ruler, bring in restoration, usher in the day of the Lord, vanquish Israel's enemies, reconcile all things unto himself, turn all that is wrong and has become right again, that he would rule, he would reign, and all the nations of the earth would be judged as he lifts up and raises up the nation of Israel and rules over all the earth. That's what they thought. And they are right because that's what will happen, but not yet. Because Jesus goes and he then shows them through all the Old Testament how all the scriptures ultimately look forward to his death, burial, resurrection, and eventual exaltation and reign. What would he have looked at? What would he have taken them to? Maybe the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, maybe Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 16, Psalm chapter 118, as we'll look at in just a second, Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, Psalm 110, over and over and over again. When we were reading uh, Bible stories to our children when they were really young, we had one that we really liked. I think it was called the Big Picture Storybook Bible. And uh, I love the illustrations because the disciples, after Jesus had been risen from the dead, they were going back and they were looking at all of their Old Testament scriptures. And, you know, in illustration form, the artist was saying they would find Jesus here. Look, he's here. Look, he's here. Look, he's here. I didn't see him, but he's here. It was all looking forward to Christ. It was all looking forward to him. Everything was looking forward to Christ. I could give you a ton of different examples but I want to give you one. Hold your finger here, and I want you to go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. I won't have time to read the entire psalm with you, but Psalm 118, verse 22 specifically, is a text that is often quoted in the New Testament. And this would have been one of these passages they would have, they would have read later, and they would have said, there's Jesus. There he is. I didn't see it before, but there is Christ. Now, the reason why I reference Psalm 118 is part of a collection of psalms called the Hallel. And the Hallel was uh, from Psalm 113 to 118. It was a collection of psalms that would have been sung at festivals like Passover. And it's very likely that the disciples that were on the road back to Emmaus would have sung Psalm 118. Maybe it was still on their minds. But look with me at verse 19, if you have your Bible. And if not, I'll read it, and it's fine. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Look at verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Look at verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? That was sung over Jesus one week prior at Palm Sunday. And now they're thinking, what in the world is the stone that the builders rejected that is now the chief cornerstone from which the entirety of the building is now shaped after and framed after? Who is that? It's Christ. He was rejected, and now he is the stone in which we understand all of our lives and understand all of our reality and understand all of our salvation so that we might be righteous and come into the presence of God righteous in Him. He was the stone that was rejected on the cross, but now He is the chief stone. And so now we are getting a clue at least of what Jesus would have been revealing to these two disciples. Now, as you continue on, we have a staying with Jesus. I love the irony here in verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us or remain with us for it is 
toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So we went on to stay with them, and when he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And look at verse 31, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They want Jesus to stay with them. I love it that Jesus, again, is kind of playing along. He was pretending to go further. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly how he was setting them up, and they want him to remain with them. And this would have been typical in the ancient world for there was no hotels or anything of that sort, and so they would have stayed in their guest lodging and guest house, uh, guest room, or whatever it is. And interestingly, these disciples were enjoying a meal, but this was one of their homes. Maybe it was Cleopas. But look who is officiating the meal. Look who is acting. It, it's almost like they are naturally deferring to Jesus. And it wasn't until Jesus broke the bread that they began to understand. Why was it with the bread being broken? Why was that 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 clued them in? We don't exactly know. It may be a callback to Jesus feeding the 5,000. It may be a callback even to the Lord's Supper. Whatever it was, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened, and they saw Jesus. Now, we could stop the story right here, but it's essential that you see what's next. There is the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Verse 32, then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the Scriptures, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying and shouting, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them and the breaking of bread. People didn't typically travel at night in those days. It was rather dangerous, but there was something that got them out of that house, and it was already dark at this moment, and they got on their, uh, on their high horse, so to speak, and went straight back to Jerusalem, found the disciples who were huddled together in fear, and said, He's risen! I have to tell you this! There's something in my heart. It was burning in my heart when I was with Him. I've got to tell you, He's risen! And let me tell you and give you an account of everything that we experience on this day. And were not our hearts burning within us, meaning there was some magnetic draw to him that we could not explain, we could not overcome. We wanted to be with him. But I have to tell you that he has risen. Here's the claim that, uh, that Christianity makes, the audacious claim. In a world where pluralism is the flavor of the day, Christianity does not say that it is one religion of many in the marketplace of ideas. Christianity says it is the only idea that really matters in a marketplace of pluralistic ideas. It is an audacious claim, but it is a claim that is based upon real space, time, and history when the God-man came to earth, died, and rose again. And on the accounts of that empty tomb, we have a story to tell. Now, the reason I love this passage so much is because I look at these two disciples and I believe that they really do stand for a representation of all of us in some way. I don't know where you find yourself on the journey today. Maybe you are a skeptic. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you don't understand the meaning of Easter. And Jesus comes into their world, takes the initiative, comes to them. And Jesus is the one that opens their eyes to the reality of who He is and what He has accomplished. I don't know where you are on that, but if you're a skeptic, here is my encouragement to you. Ask the question, why the empty tomb and why the Old Testament? It's exactly what Jesus does in this account. 
that the Old Testament literally sets the table for us to see who Jesus really is. Maybe you are a disciple of Jesus. Maybe you are one whose eyes have been opened and you say, I believe, I affirm, I rejoice. Easter is something that's magnificent. I'm reminded of the victory that I have in Christ. The admonition to all of us is that we don't sit on our hands, but we go and declare just that. That's exactly why we gather here today. I want to close and just read a, a short account, a short story from a man named Nard Puguayo. I think that's how you would pronounce his name. He says, in March of 1956, when I was about six years old, a tall, pale white man stumbled into my home village of Dibagat in the northern jungles of the Philippine island of Luzon. man didn't know how to speak our language, so our elders asked him the best way they knew how, why are you here? And the man said, I am here to tell you about God. Who is your God, they asked. Well, he is the God of all that has been created, the God of heaven and earth. Is he powerful? Yes, he's powerful, the man said. What I want to do is I want to learn your language so I can tell you more about this God. And so this man for six years spent time in this village learning the language of these native Philippines in a very remote tribe and village. When this young man was 13 years old, the missionary had to leave to go to the United States. But before he left, he left a copy of the Gospel of Mark with him for him to read in his own native language. He goes on and he tells the story. He says, while he was gone, I started reading the Bible for the first time, beginning with the Easter story, continuing through chapter 16. And sitting on top of the rock, I read the Gospel of Mark in my heart language. I felt like I was actually there seeing the characters. But the further I read, the more distressed I felt. A mob of people came to get Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he do wrong? I read as fast as I could. They accused him of all kinds of false things. They mocked him, spat on him, beat, on him, beat him, and took him before Pilate and the scourge and the crown of thorns. It was excruciating to read that they forced him to carry a wooden cross and then nailed him to it. And he says, deep in my heart, a hatred of God swelled. I shook my fist and I shouted, I hate you, God, for being so powerless. Why should I believe in a powerless God like you? And with all my strength, I threw the gospel of Mark down to the rocks and started walking home. I couldn't understand why God wouldn't protect his own son. Suddenly, God reached down into my heart. Nard, don't you understand? That's how much I love you. I gave my son on your behalf. And for the first time, Nard says, I understood grace. He went on to say, God, if you love me that much, I want to give my life and my heart. It's all yours. He goes and picks up the gospel of Mark again and reads of the account of the resurrection of Jesus. His life was changed. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day, what it means to us as believers, what it means to us as followers of Christ. We rejoice in the empty tomb of your son. We thank you, O oh God, for the greatness of this story that's historical, that's real, that gives us hope, gives us meaning where Jesus came into our world, died for us as our substitute, and overcame sin and death through his resurrection. And Father, by simply believing and entrusting ourselves to that account that we would be saved before you, but don't let us sit on our hands. Let us be your truth tellers. Let us be your witnesses. Let us be your, be your proclaimers as we make known the goodness of who Jesus really is. Father, if there's anyone that's listening, praying right now, wondering, and maybe they're a skeptic, impress upon their hearts, draw them to yourself, O oh God, open their eyes to see the reality of hope that they might see Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.